Welcome to Philosophy of Value workshops number one of series eight. And the question for today is, how does theory of mind or consciousness prefigure value as a principle of life? So we have just completed a series of workshops on various aspects of value as a principle of life. And we made numerous criticisms of objective conceptions of value as existing independently of the mind. But the subjectivist view presented here sees value as mental states influenced by theory of mind. Yet other classical theories and theories of ethics have also been influenced by particular theories of mind. For example, Emmanuel, <coughs> Emmanuel Kant's rationalist theory of mind emphasised cognition and reason to determine ethical values. Contrary to Kant, David Hume based his ethics on an empiricist theory of mind. That is, reason alone can't motivate the will but is the slave of the passions. As well as history and social theory, other theories of mind have also influenced our understanding of values. These include sociobiology, genetics and the unconscious as factors in the formation of values. And both graduated and developmental theories of mind have further added to our conception of values. Such have been presented by Jean, P Jean Piaget, Lance Kohlberg, Victor Kraft and even Darwin. But it's contentious that social or genetic factors can directly determine moral values. So for this and other reasons I look to mind or consciousness as a foundation for different kinds of value. I say different kinds of value because I'm more interested in meaning, purpose and aesthetics than ethics. Yet with respect to ethics, I refer to consciousness to show how normative values can result from volition. The origins of value will also be revealed in the fundamental selections and preferences of consciousness. Other features or structures of consciousness are also <coughs> relevant to human values and human life. These include divisibility, graduation, temporality, intentionality and ephemerality. This is why we are doing a series of workshops now on mind and consciousness. Consciousness is sometimes thought to be impossible to understand or define. I disagree. There are particular problems of understanding and defining consciousness, but these can be overcome. And like John Searle, we can provisionally define consciousness as all the mental states that we experience. Mind is a more general concept that also includes genetics, the unconscious and other, say, um, animal minds. Awareness is a particular focus or capacity of consciousness, like um, intelligence or insight. And further understanding is possible with appropriate, with, um, appropriate questions, methods and um, approaches. And against deniers of consciousness, like Richard Rorty and Daniel Dennett, I hold that consciousness exists. And because it exists, it must have properties that I believe are best described as structures. I myself hold an interactionist theory of mind and a structural account of consciousness as a process or relation. This position or positions will be explained and argued partly here and in forthcoming workshops. And I argue that the denial of consciousness is a paradoxical neglect of what we are, what, of what we you know, essentially are. 
defining features of mankind have run through a gauntlet of ideas like tool maker, language user and abstract thinker. But the overall capacity of self-consciousness that enables these abilities have been overlooked. Neither is our identity properly defined as a human organism, but as a self-conscious entity. And I also argue that with respect to questions of human existence, consciousness has primary significance. It's thought, for example, that human existence is too diverse and amorphous to be understood in one perspective. Yet an account of consciousness as a unifying perspective challenges that pessimistic account. And likewise, questions of human existence are often dismissed as misguided and meaningless. For example, Wittgenstein held that with linguistic analysis we can discover that how, how such questions are incoherent. And the aim of his philosophy was to, I quote, to show the fly the way out of the fly bottle. Yet Wittgenstein, like much of Western philosophy, was preoccupied by, by epistemology. This amounts to a bias that sets my work further apart from those views. Yet to claim that consciousness has primary significance involves the value-laden issue of priority. That issue of priority can be answered pragmatically with the explanatory power of consciousness. Yet I, yet I can also answer by recognising the authority of value as a constituent of consciousness. But this is a much later exercise. For the moment, we can illustrate the significance of consciousness by both its neglect and subsequent endorsement. In religion, for example, there's a conspicuous neglect of consciousness using only metaphors like spirit and soul. And unexpectedly, in his review of numerous studies, William Hardy found that, I quote, Aristotle for better or worse, had no concept of consciousness or not one corresponding closely to ours. The term consciousness was also only first written down by John Locke in 1681. And psychology as an explicit study of mind is only a couple of hundred years old. The neglect of mind or consciousness is both <coughs> anachronistic and unexpected because we are conscious beings. And Descartes' I think therefore I am is not only, an, is, 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 is not only um, um, indicative of a certainty about our own consciousness, it also reveals how recently this kind of awareness of ourselves came into philosophical view. For example, Edmund Husserl said that Descartes opened the door to consciousness but didn't go in. Sartre and others also find a, a, find a, a disjunction between the I think and the I am. Ricoeur describes the cogito as having a presumed certainty that can be deceived about itself. And for Heidegger, the question of being as human existence has been overlooked. Yet advocates of the significance of consciousness range from the Jungian M.L. von Franz to neuroscientist Sam Harris. Anthony Grayling states that the fact of consciousness is indisputable, its, its um, importance is supreme. And these thinkers insist on the centrality of consciousness as a cipher or nexus of experience. That is, everything of significance for us is eventually either an object or an aspect of our consciousness. More prosaically, consciousness is the only viable foundation for understanding the essentialia of human existence. That is, there are many ways to understand human existence, such as <coughs> historically, so sociology, or genetically. But in my view, 
only consciousness provides a definitive and culminating understanding. For the moment, I can note three ways in which consciousness is such a foundation. One is the ground and determinant of perception and knowledge as discovered by Kant's Copernican re revolution. Two, as the ground of morality, meaning and purpose in providing the preconditions of value. And three, consciousness is the precondition of will and choice which are essential to morals and values. There are many reasons why mind or consciousness has been o overlooked in the ancient and the modern world. We lack both concepts and a rich, con and a rich language of mind and unlike, and unlike physical objects, mind is transparent, that is, we look through it. An analytic philosophy typically adopts a physicalist account which tends to neglect consciousness. But then there are deeper structural reasons for the, for the obscurity of consciousness. Two of these are the immersion of consciousness in its own transparent perceptions and regression. Another is what we can call the non-referentiality of self-consciousness. And problems with access to self-consciousness translate into problems <coughs> apprehending consciousness. But normally when we, when we perceive of objects, we invariably perceive them in contrast to others, like a black spot on a white board. But self-consciousness cannot <coughs> apprehend other conscious beings in the same way that it apprehends itself. This results in an epistemological <coughs> impediment that hinders the apprehension of consciousness. Yet the significance of co consciousness goes beyond it being a basis for understanding either itself or the world. Consciousness is significant because it has the status of one of the fundamental modes of existence in the world. This is highlighted by Sartre's mm, distinction between conscious being for itself and physical being in itself. Consciousness isn't just a contingent mm, entity like a particular species of fauna or flora. It is both the essentialia of human existence and a fundamental aspect of all existence. But this isn't an, an endorsement of either panpsychism or cosmic co consciousness or and, ne and neither does it commit us to ju dualism which is a particular conception of mind. Yet even this kind of significance of consciousness as human experience or as a mode of being isn't enough. The kind of significance that we ultimately need isn't due to the status of consciousness in the world nor is it due to the significance of theories of consciousness in explaining human activity. It is due to the subjective significance that we can attribute to these elements as experiences in our lives. For that we must look to value as both a legislature of significance as well as a constituent of consciousness. But before discussing that, we need to say more about co consciousness as an integrative concept. Analytic philosophy t typically c classifies co consciousness into the two co cognitive and non-cognitive mental states. But this classification is biased towards co cognitivism and defines non-cognitive states ne negatively. So I supplement this classification using the four states of c cognition affect, will and value. This classification is c comprehensive and describes c consciousness mm, exhaustively. The problem of human existence as consciousness can now be given greater c specificity using these four states. My project is to work out solutions primarily in terms of value with reference to these other states. And this cl classification of four states enables me to argue for the priority of value 
over the other four states. There's a whole host of possible human and ethical objectives that be, can be classified in this way in terms of value. These include duty, self-esteem, love, meaning, purpose, goodwill and many others. But analytic philosophy tends to explain activities like morals and motivation in terms of cognition and reason. One argument is that non-cognitive theories are said to be blind and, and <coughs> unable to guide action. Yet cognitive theories are said to be impotent and unable to motivate action or morals. This is just an example of how c cognition might not provide adequate explanations. Affect states are emotions and feelings like pleasure and happiness as well as ne negative states like pain and disgust. Happiness also figures in utilitarianism in its central principle of utility. And as a social p policy, maximum ha happiness for maximum number of people is difficult to, is difficult to dispute. But as, the, but as a theory of ethics, it has serious inadequacies of justification and motivation. And happiness cannot answer questions of meaning, purpose or the why of life. Like other states, the significance of the will depends on its function and how is it used and qualified. The will or volition is a variable state ranging from Nietzsche's will to power to Kant's goodwill. And that a further feature, the ingredient required to motivate action can be described as the will. But the will is a process or a vehicle embodied in action rather than a constitutive of a state or an objective itself. And as such, the will also isn't a viable c candidate as an explanatory human objective. Yet I'm not primarily arguing against these states today, but I'm presenting them as aspects of consciousness. Nor might we be able to argue them against each other, as they seem to overlap across a spectrum. Nietzsche, for example, proposed a justification by aesthetic value that involved affective experience. Hilary Putnam presented an entanglement as the collapse of the fact-value dichotomy. An existentialist and others have described value as volitional. Moreover, such integration indicates that we may be mistaken in looking at value as just one salient feature. Yet that doesn't prevent us from considering each of these states in turn, or from considering them in combination, as I finally do in the idea of an ongoing dialectic. And these four states are the building blocks of more complex positions about consciousness. But if the explanative power of cognition, affect, will or value is insufficient, we might have to turn to the significance of, of consciousness, but not as some kind of human objective. This is because consciousness or its increase isn't a viable objective or solution in itself. This is the case for the following reasons. One, consciousness itself doesn't specify or contain the particular pr properties that may provide a resolution. Two, it incurs problems like anxiety, <coughs> anomie, f fragmentation, alienation, guilt, and an awareness of finitude. And three, structures like t temporality and divisibility and graduation render consciousness intrinsically problematic. Yet it's these structures of consciousness that enable us to explain value and its origins. The significance of both consciousness and value can be seen in their mutual relation and coexistence. To show this, 
I take an argument from Sartre that he says the being of the self as consciousness is value and that reflective consciousness cannot cannot uh, cannot arise without at the same time disclosing values Sartre builds on the idea of contrast choice and selection as constituents of both value and consciousness he holds choice as just not preference but a selection traced back to its ontological foundation and that every choice supposes mm, elimination and selection and mm, elimination and selection are expressing the values of disfavour and approval. Sartre wants to trace selection back to its ontological foundation but he doesn't do this explicitly but we can explain and extend the notions of choice and selection with the idea of contrast. Monotone is, is um, inimical to selection, choice, value, perception and indeed to consciousness. These capacities need contrast like the earlier noted black spot on a white board. We can then say that every perception entails contrast selection and value. We look one way and make a selection and preference that produces an antithesis or negation. And we can say that value is ubiquitous in every aspect or conscious or aspect of our conscious lives. And that value and consciousness are coexistent. But at least two objections can be made to this kind of explanation of incipient values. One, values also emerge from social and biological sources without selection or choice. But an automatic propensity to action is not a value. Such are only latent or potential values. They only become values on selection as preferences as of mental states. And two, they are not the values that we need in motivation, morals, meaning or purpose. But the above are just nascent values, and that is to be expected when explaining the origins of value. And further accounts of consciousness have the potential to explain more substantive values. For example, Martin Heidegger and Edmund Husserl offer such an account of time that provides more substantive values. Heidegger em emphasised temporality and time as the horizon of being. Husserl spoke of the flow of consciousness and a flow of becoming in which every experience has necessarily been preceded in time by experiences. That is, we find ourselves in a world of time or temporality as well as diversity, di divisibility, selection and choice. The diversity of the world demands selections and choice that produce value. Yet consciousness is also moving through time as well as through diversity in space and substantive values must be continually produced to, to cope with the flow of existence. But there are still problems of priority and justification of value and values to be resolved. One of these problems is that a similar <coughs> argument as above could be made for cognition as a fundamental aspect of, of consciousness. So the question arises, why give priori priority to value over cognition in a philosophy of life? It's because value is arguably p paramount in theories of ethics, meaning and purpose. And to establish p priority of value over other states, we can't avoid constraints such as posed by Hume and Moore. Hume's law or principle is that, that, is that a prescriptive moral ought cannot be derived from a factual is. To resolve this problem, I want to present a prescriptive principle of value in the form of the will to value. The will to value expresses the 
ability of reflective consciousness to choose, affirm or deny that value. Robert Nozick speaks of valuing values. I'm talking about, I'm talking about valuing value as a general principle. As a fundamental aspect of consciousness, the valuing of value or the will to value is expressed in numerable ways. For example, the will to value is expressed in positive value states such as courage, love or Nietzsche's amor fati. Yet Sartre's spirit of seriousness <coughs> illustrates two ways of failing to value value. The spirit of seriousness is to, mis is to misrepresent subjective values as objective to avoid freedom and responsibility. The classic example is to say, in bad faith, that I have no choice. This makes a supposed error of taking the idea or have no choice as an objective fact or value. This is a failure to value value because it is a refusal to choose, and choice is a fundamental property of value. Yet it is also a failure to value value because it is valuing an object or principle which has no value in itself. That is, arguably, only people as self-conscious beings and mental states are candidates of intrinsic value. On this view, principles or objects only have instrumental value attributed to them by people. So to take principles or objects as having intrinsic value co contradicts the will to value. This view of the will to value as valuing truly intrinsic values leads to a property that we can call self-validation. Self-validation is a way of justifying systems faced with problems such as posed by human law. Self-validating pr principles are used to justify logic and mathematics, but not thought possible in physics or ethics. Logic is determined by the self-evident and self-validating truths of Aristotle's four basic principles of logic. David Hilbert described ma mathematics as avoidance of c contradiction and is therefore a self-validating a priori. A self-validating system within the human sphere may be Descartes' I think, therefore I am. But physics also isn't self-validating because it's an a posteriori system of contingent observations. Mathematics or logic are self-validating, but they can't establish principles or systems of physics or ethics. But I propose that the will to value is self-validating because the alternative is contradictory and self-negating. And systems of value need a self-validating principle due to problems such as posed by Hume. <coughs> I have just noted two reasons why not to value value is contradictory, self-negating and self-defeating. One a failure to value value is found in a refusal to choose which is a fundamental property of value. And two, valuing objects or principles as intrinsic values is regressive, co uh, contradictory and simply <coughs> erroneous. That is, not to value value is also, a neg is also a negation of the principle of value that drives and culminates all conscious existence. But this presupposes the principle of the will to value that I've been um, arguing for mm, implicitly in this paper. That is, the structures of consciousness and value constrain and direct our choices towards valuing. A related example of such, of such a constraint is Sartre's um, idea that we are condemned to choose, condemned to, condemned to be free. Another is Heidegger's and Husserl's above account of time that reveals the inescapability of value. But the question can be posed, what does the will to value lead to 
or amount to. Firstly, it need not lead to anything. It could be its own reward as a value or as a tenable theory. But I hold that the will to value or the value of value results in a certain sufficiency of value. That is, the will to value evokes the kinds of value that enjoy a sufficiency of value. Sufficiencies of value are value states like self-esteem, dignity, courage, patience and magnanimity. Yet of course human finitude means that sufficiencies are always <coughs> insufficient and are works in progress. And value sufficiency has a certain <coughs> independence of experience comparable to happiness and pleasure. I previously explained this sufficiency of value in detail, but I can make a couple of comparisons here. Firstly, the idea of God is a historical development of the believer's highest value characterised by sufficiency. And Aristotle's <coughs> eudaimonia is a supreme good which he also qualifies as self-sufficient. And, and as the supreme good is a moral concept, it can be inferred to be a sufficiency of value. My point is about value sufficiency as an object in both theory of value and in human experience. I noted ethical principles as values that guide our actions and ethical fortitude expresses resiliency of value. A meaningful life is also a valuable and worthwhile life that is sufficient to confront loss and adversity. These examples show that the notion of values at sufficiency would not be viable as a maximization of value. Value sufficiency can't be a matter of quantification but of quality and an appreciation of absence and of the other. Also, human beings aren't absolute spirits with sufficient value able to confront every contingency. People need supportive ideas like religious belief, political ideals, personal support and ideologies. And religion can be usefully cited as a paradigm example of a supporting cognitive framework. Belief in God, doctrine and church structures provide the cognitive support that experience requires. Social esteem and other people's regard is another huge part of a supporting cognitive framework. My usual example is of a five-year-old who needs parental <coughs> approval not required by a 25-year-old. Yet both the examples of a child and of religion show we are dealing with a progress, a process of development. And in that de development, we can see a preference for independence and a sufficiency of value. As noted here and elsewhere, values, human action and, and, <coughs> and experience are entangled with supporting cognitive frameworks. And it is always the case that the value and value sufficiency is in a dialectical relation with cognitive structures. Yet value sufficiency is driven by the principle of value, seeking further value, to value value as the will to value. In this dialectic, value seeks <coughs> independence from cognitive support, which produces further value. And this value again needs support, which again seeks further value. This is the dialectic between the relative sufficiency of value states and supporting cognitive structures. Yet the relative sufficiency of value is a sufficiency expressed in such ways as moral fortitude and self-esteem. In this way, the theoretical principle of the will to value is also a principle of life and in life experience. So I conclude with the principles of the will to value and a sufficiency of value, and that these follow from structures of consciousness different from Kant's and Hume's theories of mind. Those were not able, able to 
ad adequately resolve problems of priority and justification of value. But values derived from structures of consciousness already contain certain values and volitions, and these inescapably direct value by means of authentic choice and an affirmation or the will to value. Yet the story of these principles doesn't begin in theories of ethics or other human activities. It begins with the obfuscation, neglect and realisation of the significance of consciousness. And we noted particular problems in apprehending consciousness. We found that an, an analysis of consciousness in terms of cognition, affect, will and value results in comparisons and contrasts of these states that leads to value as the most significant state. Yet as a state of consciousness, the significance of value was, was um, enhanced, not just as a fundamental aspect of the world, but also in its relations to selection, choice and pr preference as fundamental aspects of consciousness. This led to a form of validation in which not to value value is contradictory and self-defeating. The unexpected consequence for life, meaning and human purpose is the discovery of a principle in terms of value, that is long-standing values like ethical fortitude and independence from social endorsement find a new basis and that a guiding principle can be produced from the subjective structures of consciousness. I will be working through such aspects of consciousness in forthcoming workshops. The kind of response to this work that I'm looking for is either a recognition of how a clarification might have been made of the enigma of human existence, or as well as re refutations and criticisms showing how I have been mistaken. So let me have your comments or criticisms at the meeting or on websites like zoom or meetup.com.